Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Marcus is here, Caleb is here. We're gonna get back into a uh, variety of religious experience. At this point in time, I've already put up some videos on um, James' other book, The Will to Believe. So uh, you better believe you should go check out those videos. And, uh, but, and so that the, I sometimes I'll reference this stuff in those videos and sometimes I'll reference that stuff in these videos. So um, it's good, there's a good relationship between them. And uh, it just, they're just the more William James the better. But um, yeah, so today we're doing the chapter on saintliness and it's a particularly long chapter. So um, we're gonna have to get into it right away. We might be a little bit rusty um, because it's long and it took us a while between this and the last one. So bear with us if there's some uh, pauses, etc. But, um, and oh, we're doing a screen share thing. So I think on the screen, you guys should see um, the actual text here. So I might be scrolling through it, looking at it, highlighting this, that, and the other. So there you go. Yeah. Um, okay. But um, how does he start? So finally, he's, al he's always talking about fruits, not roots, right? What is the outcome of something? It tells you a little bit more about what it is than where it comes from sometimes. Um, especially in empirical mode of thinking, where something is headed tells you just as much about what it is. Um, and so this is, this is where religion is headed, towards being a saint. These are the fruits of a religious life, and now we're going to analyze them. Um, and he says this, this is probably the pleasant, these are the pleasantest part of his lecture series, and these are true examples of the um, strenuous mood. So, um, yeah, and, and this is another one of his examples of that he mentioned towards the beginning of the book that I guess we don't have a video on that he mentioned towards the beginning of the book of um, picking out the um, the most extreme examples of a religious life at, to isolate what's important about it, right? So most of the people in this book is not, it's not standard experience and he realizes that, but what he's doing is he's picking the most extreme examples because that shows us what happens at the extreme ends of things, so. Yeah, let's get into it. Um, yeah, so he talks about this guy Saint Bevue. I don't. Do you remember? Do you know who Saint Bevue is? Uh, no, I don't. Um, I, he's not a saint. It's just a guy yeah. whose name is Saint Bevue. Saint Bevue. Confusing for this chapter, frankly. Yeah. He could have picked someone else. <laughs> but um, and um, I guess this is this is the um, this is like the convergence test for truth in a way. So um, what St. Bavu talks about is, this is a quote from him, through all the different forms of communion and all the diversity of the means which help to produce this state, whether it be reached by a jubilee, by a general confession, by a solitary prayer and effusion, whatever in short be the place and the occasion, it is easy to recognize that it is fundamentally one state in spirit and fruits. So all Christians produce the same fruits and that's what's common about Christians. Um, in some sense, Christians in different parts of the world converge on one type of life, um, which is what's interesting about them, what kind of where the truth is in them. So, um, you know, any thoughts on that? Because I think that's very important to radical empiricism and James's whole style of philosophy. Uh, yeah, I, I think it's just, it's definitely an important note and something good to, to clarify, especially going into this chapter, because the different denominations, um, definitely like theologically are distinct. Um, and so it's good to kind of have that unifying force, um, to kind of clarify what is useful pragmatically to separate, um, groups by, and so he's separating them by like the, the commonalities of the um, the fruits or the, yeah, of what people are doing. Mm -hmm. And um, it's very much like, if you think of C.S. Lewis as mere Christianity, that's kind of like a lowest common denominator doctrines, right? This is what all, maybe 95% of, of de denominations believe. Jesus was the son of God. Jesus was God. Um, things like that. And just very s simply like that. But this is almost a different kind of mere Christianity. <clears throat> like it's almost like mere Christian behavior, which actually, 
now that I think about it, that's one of the subsections of mere Christianity, Christian behavior. Really? So maybe there's something to what Lewis was saying too. But Lewis says it much more like this is what Christian doctrine prescribes. As that it, people should do. As an ideal. Yeah. But this is more, this is what Christian spirits give forth. Yeah, what they end up doing. Talking about them, yeah. Yeah. So um, they start to talking about um, types of character as due to the balance of impulses and in inhibitions. So it's very important that we have emotions that push us towards something and emotions that scare us from something, right? And um, and so that there might be different conditions inside different people, different levels of um, emotional excitement, and um, like. It's, a, it's very much like if you think of, I like to think of it as vectors. So if you have different vectors um, pushing you in different directions, they're like different forces. On the outside, even though it may look like, like, um, like if there's one vector that's magnitude five north and one that's magnitude four south, it looks like a magnitude one north vector, right? But if there's, if all there is in me is one impulse north, by of a magnitude one it looks the same on the outside but what he's saying here is that what's important is that under the surface there is a different panoply of impulses and inhibitions depending on your personal character and so under pressure this is going to matter um mm -hmm. to how how you respond to different environmental pressures and so saints in a sense have a very high um, vector kind of hidden underneath the surface that you can't see easily but that under certain pressures will come out um, I, re I wrote a blog post about this like a year ago I remember that yeah, yeah. it was about demonstrated preferences right yeah that's basically what it is mm -hmm. and so just just because two people are performing the same actions doesn't actually mean they have the same preferences under yeah. different conditions with the same goods they might buy in a different, a different bundle or something like that. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah. So, um, yeah. Okay. This section on sovereign excitements is the next part. Um, I guess he's just talking about like the emo, there might be some impulse that just happens to be higher than every other impulse. And this is like the King impulse that organizes everything else. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. And all kind of like the rest of your soul gets washed up in your one, your love of God or your love of this or your love of that. So. Yeah. He talks about the soldier having that multiple, the, the conflicting impulses and inhibitions. He's got like his love for his life, um, like pulling him back, but his like desire to like be part uh, be one with his comrades and to uh, not be a coward pushing him forward. And so you've got these conflicting impulses that end up resulting in him either running forward or running back. Um, but these both impulse and inhibition are manifest within them. But mm -hmm. yeah. Um, and, and so, yeah, that's what he's kind of saying with, there's not necessarily a sovereign um, emotion that you can have a multiplicity of the yeses and of the noes, um, just kind of countering itself, counter, countering each other out and resulting in something that looks like the mm -hmm. dominant. Yeah, and so, so um, some people have kind of like a higher, um, higher threshold for being able to overcome um, like specific temptations or trivial temptations. And now that I think about it, if he uses the word trivial, how that relates to um, the, um, the will to believe where he talks about trivial decisions versus momentous decisions. Yeah. Um, I don't know, that's maybe some, uh, I don't know, maybe, I don't know if it relates to the same word. Don't look at yeah. Um, but um, yeah, so some, some things might seem omnipotent if they're um, sovereign, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, if this even a little bit bleeds over into um, like political ideology at all either because um, like on the liberal end of the spectrum of being more um, having a positive view of change you'd be like that'd be associated with be 
giving into your impulses, whereas like conservatism yeah. uh, would be holding on to your inhibitions. So I wonder if like this manifests, if there's crossover between like religious temperament and political ideology. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, that's something that I'd want to look into further too, because in one of the chapters in Principles of Psychology is on habit. Mm-hmm. And he calls habit the conservative agent in society because people's habits. Yeah. Well, that would be habit is in sense, habit is kind of like an impulse and an inhibition. It's an impulse wrapped in inhibitions. So it's like a preserved standard behavior. Kind of the way he describes it is like a river that's eroded the water, like a, a trickle of water that's eroded a path so that it can create a river. Yeah. And um, so like a, a river is like the conservative habits in society. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's very exciting. Yeah, for sure. And the, Peterson, I'm sure, has stuff on that. Peterson, I'm sure. Probably. Yeah. Um, and pa- and not Paget, I was going to say. Jonathan Haidt, different Jonathan. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Paget's stuff is, uh, or uh, again, Haidt stuff, it's good, but there's definitely holes in it. But it's good. Mm-hmm. It's a good start, I think, for this kind of stuff. But okay. we can, we'll, we'll move on here. So yeah, but then he just starts talking about actual saints. Um, they're people who are able to overcome small, trivial things because of they're animated by some higher ideal, um, and they're able to oh, they're they're able to turn what looks big to other people in, internally into something small, um, and they, so they have these this creative religious potential. So he says. Um, the religious, when people have a religious focus, it creates glowing magnanimities and like something that is so intense in front of their face that they uh, can't resist it. And um, I guess he says about Teresa and Loyal that, that the melting mood from the past um, chapter where your focus kind of melts and then you sort of refocus on something higher, it's almost like they're constantly refocusing on God. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah that kind of really to stuff that Peterson talks about of like having the your hierarchy of of desires and like it points to having like some kind of ultimate desire and so mm-hmm. um definitely like having a focus on and visualizing that that highest desire and um that ideal would give you something that kind of would help you transcend your lowest order problems and complications right Mm -hmm. so i think that's at least somewhat what's going on here um moments uh for ordinary folk are what may uh no that's not sorry i got lost Mm. Yeah, we can just push on. You got what? We can just push oh, on. Oh, oh, sorry. Sorry. Um, yeah, so I, when, when someone reaches this point, the saintliness point, they might be beyond sensual impulses forever. Mm-hmm. Um, and so this could this is similar to the conversion stuff. Like like all the, the drunkards that were talked about in the last chapter, then after they've gone through their conversion might be considered in a saintly state about their their addiction or, or, or what have you. Right. Yeah. So, um, and then he talks about, uh, there's might be some subconscious things involved. It's not clear. Um, and your mind has, has, it's interesting. Think of it as like a dodecahedron, right? So it's got many spaces that it can fall on and it's got many angles that it can be pushed in. But when he talks about these like mind equilibriums of like refocus and reorienting towards something, there's different places that it can rest on. So yeah. it can be pushed in different directions as well. So, but some, maybe some, if you think of a, um, you might think of it like a, like a half ball, like a half sphere, where if it's on the ball side, you can push it in all different directions and it'll wobble this way, that way. But then if it's on the um, flat side, 
whichever way you push it, it's not going to move. Like so yeah. that's like it being in equilibrium as opposed to in its fluctuous state. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So then, and then he starts, he wants to start pinholing down to specific things and get into specific attitudes. So he says the, the there's a few different characteristics of, um, of a saint, like a feeling of importance wider than this world, a sense of friendliness with the ideal power, an immense elation and freedom as the self melts away, and a shift towards yes, and rather than a shift towards the yes, yes set of impulses, rather than the no, no set of inhibitions, right? So, um, so the, the, these are all kind. These are all really about being at some kind of having some vector with massive magnitude, like the greatest ideal power. So a saint has to be animated by some spirit. That's a, every time you hear the word animated, think of something spiritual. Yeah, because that's what it means in Latin. Animus means spirit. So so animu and so animus means um, male spirit. Anima means female spirit. So if you listen to the Tool song Anima, it's about um, nature en enveloping like the sinful Los Angeles, basically. It's pretty huh. sick. Pretty, 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 pretty sick. Okay, and um, then he starts to talk about specific uh, consequences, kinds of people in the world. So like you've got, um, or like different, like specific activities that might show up asceticism like a positive pleasure in sacrificing things um having a strong soul courage getting rid of different fears and anxieties having a sense of purity about yourself um and an, and an increasing sense of charity for other people so you're you overcome the discord between your and other people's sentiments and this is how you can actually get to the point where you love your enemies as jesus commands yeah so like these are and now um let me see let me think so i get in what way do all of these have to do if our hypothesis is that all of these have to do with some higher power how do all of these relate to some massive among all the different vectors some massive magnitude vector yes if it's I, a higher ideal yeah um so like fears and anxieties going away makes sense because if you're pushing towards a higher ideal suffering some kind of lower level cost is okay because you're sacrificing it for some kind of high vector like incredibly powerful vector right so mm -hmm. if you're doing something because god wants you to having some kind of inhibition of whatever it is so if god doesn't want you to drink your desire to drink can much more be much more easily overcome if it's something that god wants you to stop doing instead of it being like your friend telling you to stop mm -hmm. um so yeah see that for strength of soul um yeah. and then charity at least with the the idea of if you have the belief that there's a that God loves you, loves other people in the same way that he loves you, that should translate into you loving your fellow creature as well. And so I can see how that translates pretty easily as well. Mm -hmm. um, um, but th that one depends on which religion you're in too. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Depends how you treat. So I get, he, he is more or less for the whole book, assuming Christianity and every once in a while he brings up Islam or Hinduism or Buddhism, but those are, when those are on the table, they're brought up. So yeah. it's almost like he's assuming Christianity, because almost the entire chapter is about Christianity. Yeah. Which is, I mean, it's not, it's, that's what he had to observe, so. Yeah. Yeah. And it was the core of his audience that you're speaking to yeah, exactly. as, as well. Yeah. If this is a time, uh, I, I doubt he could have gotten in trouble for being saying something good about other religions i don't know i don't know i don't know what it was like i mean where, where was this edinburgh that he gave this talk i don't know what they were like i think so yeah yeah um so i guess yeah so one of the other feelings moving on of um 
saintliness is a sense of the reality of a higher power that's constantly weighing down, like controlling um, you. And it gives you, it, you, you develop that intense friendliness with the higher power that he talks about. And so he, there's an account from Mrs. Jonathan Edwards of feeling the love of Christ for an entire night. She was just awake the whole night and like, oh, wow, I feel the love of Christ the entire night. And then she go, and then you wake up from that kind of thing and then go, yeah, now I am willing to live outside of heaven on this earth of torment, even if it would honor God. And then that, that vector becomes the primary source of inspiration in your life. Yeah. And then the, the, this chapter has a lot of um, examples of people go uh, like going through massive shifts and stuff like that. So, yeah, I thought Thoreau's account of the, the friendliness of nature was interesting because mm -hmm. that's nature is not necessarily something that you'd think of as like a higher power. Um, it's something vaster than us, but not necessarily like hierarchically in a hierarchy is not necessarily like higher or lower. Um, so I think now maybe it's not necessarily the sense of like a higher power and something that has dominion over you, but just something, the, the realization of the greatness or vastness of reality, because that's probably what you'd have with Buddhists as well, right? Mm -hmm. Is they don't have, the belief in God, but they still have that belief in the, the vastness and the greatness of the whole. Do they? I don't know. I think so. Um, was just about eradicating desire. I don't know. I could be getting Buddhism totally wrong. You might, maybe that's more like Hinduism. I know, I know Hinduism definitely has like you, everyone is like, connected to or uh to like atman the uh, like supreme being or whatever which is like mm -hmm. the deity that is the whole so yeah i don't know um it would definitely have to be something looked into but hmm. yeah it, when when the, like in in um pantheism what is the animating ideal i think that's a big part of james and his criticism of pantheism is that it doesn't exactly create any major animating ideals. Yeah. That's one of the reasons he doesn't really like it because he calls it later pragmatically meaningless. How did he, um, what did you use to, to back that up or make that claim? Like in the sense that if, if everything is the one, yeah. then when you genuinely feel a crossroads, how does your belief in the oneness of everything tell you what to do in what that? What to do in that? Okay, yeah, that makes sense. Right. So, yeah. I don't, like, it animates you, but what does it exactly animate you to do? Not really anything particular. So, the the vector has like zero. It's like a zero zero direct. It's like on a new axis that goes nowhere. <laughs> so yeah, that's that's what he would call something that's pragmatically meaningless. Yeah. Um. Yeah, so, okay, the next section is on um, peace of mind, and he starts talking about having a faith state, which I get, he, he mentioned faith state in the last chapter, right? Yeah. Yeah, having a faith state and this, like, intense feeling like that, and, and um, yeah, so um, you start, and, and charity, and you start to give to others. Mrs. Edwards felt this, and then... Um, there was a really cool story. I liked the story of Richard Weaver, who had, uh, who would always get into fights with people, and then eventually he gets to the point where he, um, his wife doesn't want him to fight anymore, and he realizes as a Christian he should not fight. And then some guy hits him at work, and he doesn't hit back. And then he comes the next day, and the guy goes like, "Oh, are you gonna hit me back?" And then he doesn't hit him again. And then that turns the that makes the guy realize the love that he's feeling, and then turns outward like that right yeah so i think that that's kind of what james is saying is that that i think because it's love your enemies seems contradictory right but he's yeah. trying to say that it's not contradictory it's the height of magnanimity meaning that the idea when when you like let's say i hate you for some reason right yep. 
whatever the the love that I have to feel that that makes you my enemy. Just the simple fact that there's a vector between you and me that makes me that it force forces me in some way to want to hit you, right? The vector going in the opposite direction has to be a greater force, force yeah. greater spirit. So it has to be magnanimous. So love your enemy. Loving your enemy is actually evidence of magnanimity, not weakness. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's having the love for others always overwhelming, um, like your other, your desires to, to do wrong to them. Yeah. The, the question is something like, does my love for you outrun my hate for you? Yeah. And then that means it's truly a great thing. And so ha even having, if you, if you deal with someone enough, you're going to learn something you don't like about them. Mm -hmm. So you kind of have to cultivate the magnanimous love beforehand to actually have it work at all. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I guess they say Assisi and Loyola say that your enemies expands to anybody who might repulse you in some way, like somebody on the side of the street. So the story of the Good Samaritan like that. Yeah. And then he talks about um, people just having kind of inner peace and tranquility. This, this makes sense to me because at least if, even if the vectors in your life are moving around, the fact that one of them stands out above the others in such a strong way means that your orientation doesn't shift as much. Yeah. Which is what's more peaceful. I have, if anybody wants to look, now that I'm talking about all the vectors, this chapter makes way, way, way more sense and what the point of it is. Yeah. I think so and too. Um, there's an article that I wrote when I was a freshman. It's like April 2017, I think it might be, March or April 2017. And it's, that's when I was thinking about vectors a lot. And I used vectors like as my examples for everything because I thought they were so awesome. And that's when I was really starting to get into William James and into Jordan Peterson and, and stuff like that. So yeah. I, I literally, it's, I, I didn't even write anything. I just made an outline and put it up there. It doesn't, it doesn't really make sense, but yeah, I think it's just, one of the, the funner things that I wrote. It was one of the more impactful things I wrote, I'll say. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, and then people relax. Oh, that's good. I guess I copied this, this passage here. Do you want to read that? Yeah. This is about uh, St. Catherine of Genoa. Yeah. Uh, to her holy soul, the divine movement was the, pre uh, divine moment was the present moment. And when the present moment was estimated in itself and in its relations, and when the duty that was involved in it was accomplished, it was permitted to pass away as it, uh, as if it had never been and to give away to the facts and the and duties of the moment which came after yeah so if she she's able to deal with the smaller things better because she's not anxious about them not mattering in the long about everything not mattering in the long run she's not stuck with anything mortal because she has something immortal mm -hmm. she's above it that's that ties into the the relationship between elves and humans in lord of the rings too <laughs> So it all goes back to Tolkien. Always oh, does. Yeah. And then he talks about um, people having pure lives. They just are motivated to live purely. They, they're disgusted by smoking and these other little behaviors like that. So that's exciting yeah. too. I thought that was interesting because I always associated like um, people wanting to or feeling like they needed to quit smoking with the, the anti-smoking campaigns with it, uh, like the, the 1950s and 60s, but didn't think that there would any, really be any reason for people to do that earlier before they realized smoking yeah. was bad for you. Or people, um, yeah. But I guess like back then it was still um, something, it was a, a habit or um, an addiction that you're dependent on. And then it was um, physical pleasure that you're getting out of it, right? Or, yeah physical or psychological pleasure and so um i can see how the guy would still have a problem with it even before you realize that it's bad for you yeah physically. even if someone realizes that um it doesn't kill you like mm -hmm. lung cancer they you cough like more yeah know? so I, I i don't even though they didn't have the the medical 
research that said it was bad for you. I think they had an instinct that it wasn't like good for you. Maybe yeah. they thought they must probably thought it was good for you. Actually, I don't know. But yeah, I see what you're saying. There, there yeah. is regardless. It's like a temporal, trivial pleasure. Yeah, trivial yeah. pleasure that you shouldn't be attached to. And so maybe it's the the attachment that is really the problem there. Yeah. Um. I guess I. I talked about, okay, and then next he goes into asceticism. I'll just read all the different levels of asceticism that he l lays out. So first is asceticism might be a mere, like these are kind of increasing intensity levels of asceticism. Maybe a mere expression of organic hardihood disgusted with too much ease, okay? Second is temperance in meat and drink, simplicity of apparel, chastity and non-pampering of the body generally, and maybe the fruits of the love of purity, shocked by whatever savors of the sensual. Next level, they may also be the fruits of love. That is, they may appeal to the subject in the light of sacrifices, which he is happy in making to the deity whom he acknowledges. You know what? Yeah. Um, this is in the actual book on page uh, 296. I'll just go to it real quick. That's probably scroll to that. <laughs> yeah, I guess I haven't been using this at all, huh? Yeah. But um, I just wanted to use it because I wanted to read the whole last page. Um, yeah, okay, here it is. So these are the first two, three level. The fourth level, again, ascetic mortifications and torments may be due to the pessimistic feelings about the self combined with theological beliefs concerning expiation. The devotee may feel that he is buying himself free or escaping worse sufferings hereafter by doing penance now. The next level, in psychopathic persons, mortifications may be entered on irrationally by a sort of obsession or fixed idea which comes as a challenge and must be worked off because only thus does the subject get his interior consciousness feeling right again. Next, finally, ascetic exercises may in rare instances be prompted by genuine perversions of the bodily sensibility, in consequence of which normally pain-giving stimuli are actually felt as pleasures. So this is how insane and intense asceticism can get. Yes. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, and th there's d many different ways that it can be understood or 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 framed or etc cetera, etc cetera. so um yeah but but he talks about the last century the 19th century um having a different moral attitude towards pain right because pain is not like an inherent thing to them anymore it's yeah. like you can you can reasonably expect to have a life without severe pain whereas beforehand you cannot reasonably expect to have a life without severe pain yeah where yeah so I guess he's, and then he says again, I highlighted this, that he attributes this to a disconnection from the Catholic church. And I'm not sure why he just kind of says it. Um, that's, that's something that might, we might want to look into more. Let me look, just look up mother church. Cause I think he uses that phrase specifically. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah, I was thinking, you know, the, the first level of asceticism that he describes is pretty common today. Um, the mm -hmm. second and third are somewhat less common, but still pretty common. But once you hit the fourth, fifth, and sixth, those are things that you barely ever see. Um, even the fourth one, like, I don't think I've ever met anyone who, like, hurts themselves in order to, because they think that God wants them to do it for punishment for their sins. I don't think I've met anyone like that. And, but I know at least during the plagues, the, um, the flagellants, they would go around whipping themselves, trying to purify themselves mm -hmm. um, from the sins that were associated with the plague. So, so maybe that's at least somewhat where he gets that connection. Cause I remember you're still under the Catholic church during the time of the plagues. And when that was a popular movement, Right. So it might just be a tradition thing. Now he's not talking about some kind of institutional thing. It just happens that the Catholics had that tradition. Yeah. So I think um, he actually talks about it maybe a little bit later on um, where they institutionalized um, and codified um, the proper ways to do it, right? To, um, to practice ascetic self-mortification. Um, so there are certain practices that you should or shouldn't do with that. So I think the codification of that um, makes it more associated with the Catholic church. And that was just like a history kind of thing. Yeah. 
Um, yeah. Um. So it's not it's it's not like a massive thing that I think we need to spend too much time on, but it is interesting that he does bring them up. Yeah, I always find it. I keep finding it interesting whenever he brings them up. Yeah. 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 But um, yeah. So he does talks about this is when he gets into a lot of different people's stories, and he talks about people feeling shit. He talks about Carlisle at some points felt ashamed of the warmth of his bed that he wasn't able to survive outside of it. Right. And then he talks about, I'll just go through the list of the names. There was um, Channing, John Senek, um, M. Vianney, Cotton Mather, uh, St. John of the Cross, and Suso. So the ones that are most interesting, Cotton Mather gave up his wife when his wife died. He had to realize that he was resigning that from the world very much. He me- I think he mentioned Abraham and it very much reminded me of Kierkegaard's infinite resignation. Um, the St. John of the Cross gives directions for self-mortification. Those are really interesting where he goes. Um, well, let me find those John of the Cross things because that, that was very interesting. The guy that came to, to um, Klein's reading group one time was about a St. John of the Cross fan, right? Yeah. He, yeah, he was a big Aquinas fan, but was going to get into St. John of the Cross yeah. more. So these are some of the things that St. John says. Let your soul therefore turn always, not to what is most easy, but to what is hardest, not to what tastes best, but to, do, to what is most distasteful, not to what most pleases, but to what disgusts, not to matter of consolation, but to matter for desolation, rather, not r- matter for desolation, rather, not to rest, but to labor, not to desire the more, but the less, not to aspire to what is highest and most precious, but to what is lowest and most contemptible, not to will anything, but to will nothing, not to seek the best in everything, but to seek the worst, so that you may enter for the love of Christ into a complete destitution of perfect poverty of spirit and an absolute renunciation of everything in this world. Embrace these practices with all the energy of your soul and you will find in a short time great delights and unspeakable consolations. And he says, has a few more of these. Oh, a lot more of these. <laughs> but you, you, I mean, you get the gist, right? Yeah. Yeah. And then, but the big crazy one is Suso. This guy is crazy. Oh my gosh. Wow. It's like intense. So he basically, he took like, um St. John's advice like really to heart so what did he do he wore like clothes with nails in it that would be constantly stabbing him he did he put himself on a cross he he carried a cross around with him wherever he went it had like 30 spikes in it and I love the line where he he talked about how he originally put it on and then thought the spikes were too sharp so he dulled them with rocks and then um, he cursed himself for his womanly cowardice. And yeah. so he went back and resharpened them. <laughs> yeah. um, and so, um, I think yeah. he did not die though too. I don't know. Yeah. He's constantly <laughs> bleeding. Yeah. And then he surrounds himself with insects. Yeah. And then he would like sleep on peas or something. No, not peas. He yeah. had like, for his clothes, he had rough hair too, using uh, was used to make it so that it would chafe him and like he'd be bleeding. Yeah, like, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, exciting. <laughs> yeah. It's insane. Yeah. Um. Yeah, the cross with thirty protru- uh, protruding iron needles and nails. This he bore uh, on his bare back between his sho- uh, between his shoulders. Uh, day and night, the first time that he stretched it out, uh, this cross upon his back, his tender frame was struck with terror at it, and he blunted the sharp nails slightly against the stone. But soon, repenting from this womanly cowardice, he pointed them all again with a file and placed it one uh, placed once more the cross upon him. Yeah. Gosh. Yeah. Yeah, intense guy. Mm-hmm. But that's what it's like. So that that's like the the peak example, yeah. Right, Suso. Yeah. Well, that sounds interesting. Maybe I'll do that. Just like next week or something. One step at a time, man. Yeah, that's the first step. I. It's a big step. Yeah. Well, that's yeah. a big step. Yeah. So okay, then next. This is okay. So this section here, obedience, is the next part. 
And this is when he talks about um, this, or this is the part that Hayek cites, which is very interesting. Hayek cites this in Constitution of Liberty, because I go through all my books and I look in the index for William James. So, and this is how I find think, what Hayek cites. So I know every single time Hayek cites William James. Oh, maybe I don't know everyone. Well, I'll figure it out later. Most of them. Yeah, most of them. So he says, an important part in saintly life requires chastity, obedience, and poverty. And then he starts, this is a very interesting thing. He starts talking about Protestantism. Protestants very much don't have an idea of obedience to anything other than God. And then it ends up kind of a little bit abstract. And it's almost like things in social life are all about the personal. Since there's no one between you and God, social obligations are very complicated. And they're much more commercial. And they're much more about how can I benefit from you? So um, this, is, this is a section that I copied here that, I, that was very interesting. On the lowest possible plane, one sees how the expediency of obedience in a firm ecclesiastical organization must have led to its being viewed as meritorious. Next, experience shows us that there are times in everyone's life when one can be better counseled by others than by oneself. Inability to decide is one of the, most, is one of the commonest symptoms of fatigued nerves. Friends who see our troubles more broadly often see them more wisely than we do. So it is frequently an act of excellent virtue to consult and obey a doctor, a partner, or a wife. But leaving these lower prudential regions, we find in the nature of some of the spiritual excitements which we have been studying good reasons for idealizing obedience. So he's saying, yeah, Protestants will figure out that they should obey others when it happens to benefit them. Right? Yes. Which I think describes the way that they do um, theology, too, because it's very much like I'm sitting here. I, there's no, like, something ends up filling if 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 all you have is just i'm going to obey god period that's your only doctrine then you there's nothing sort of in the middle to tell you what to do about particulars yeah so you and then so then they end up bringing in something like sola scriptura to distinguish biblically based versus non-biblically based and then you say okay i'm going to obey anything that's biblically based but then it's very un there are different contradictory things that people say are biblically based. So it kind of collapses in on itself as a doctrine. I think it can't be actually followed. Mm -hmm. but, um, so or, it, say, or if it, it support, it purports to be followed, but what's actually happening is some other obedience is slipping in. Yeah. And so, so I know lots of people will talk about um, like relying on the council of elders. And so, people will still in Protestant churches yeah. will listen to their pastors, will listen to people who are older than them, people who have been Christians for longer than them, people who are more educated than them. Um, but those channels are less formalized and institutionalized, right? So I can yeah. choose much more easily the pastor that I go to listen to or the, um, yeah, the, the elders or whoever that I'm seeking advice to. I have, I think, in in a Protestant situation, you have more leeway on who you go to for that kind of advice, and then over um, if you decide to follow it or not. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, it's difficult to, um, like, the Anglican Church has that middle. They have the, they still have, like a remnant of the structure of authority. Yeah. So, and then he gets into this. Yeah. When he talks about Ignatius loyal, what, what, what obedience is, is it's sacrifice of the intellect and the will. So that's what you're giving up is your own intellect and your own will. So yeah. you're saying these are worthless relative to this higher thing. And then in the, in the monastery, the abbot represents God. So, in in the same way, this is very this was very interesting that um, Ignatius Loyola said when you're subjecting yourself to this kind of obedience, all the superiors have to be equal as if, like as if they're all God. So they're kind of stand-ins for God, right? Now, as soon as you say that, it gets like a like what this person cannot pretend to actually be God, but. Mm -hmm. So I'd want to look into more, because I'm sure they recognize that too. They don't want to have any human agent representing God. Or having this 
yeah having the same power as god yeah yeah or that's not represent that's not christ himself right yeah exactly so when they say that they the abbot stands in for god what to what zone of action is the abbot limited yeah and it might be something like um like the the monk says you can do you can see i don't know that makes you feel uncomfortable when you say yeah that he gives up their total obedience to another human mm -hmm. you could say that to god but it's then it's not as particular so we want something particular and it ends up being another person and it gets uh kind of ugly in the in-between but yeah but what was very interesting is superiors are equal before god similar to how mm -hmm. everyone relative to us is equal it's, it, since relative to god we're all equal even yeah. if there are still hierarchies in what we do relative to god we're all equal same thing with superiors so if if there are competing superiors then you can't really have peace and obedience proper obedience yeah yeah oh i get that's the point isn't it that if you can't if your superiors can fight back and forth with one another mm -hmm. then they're not both superiors yeah then one one is more right than the other yeah 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 and that that's something that we can tag Jacob for because he's working on in history um general pluralism and sort of I have an obligation to the king and I have an obligation to the church and when do these things conflict? I have an obligation to my family as distinct from the church and the this and I have an obligation to God, maybe even beyond the church. Mm -hmm. So there's when there's competing superiors like this, it's hard to act, actually obey any one of them. Yeah. Um, which is very interesting. Yeah, and then he talks about po poverty. So he actually says, like, this one's kind of easy. Um, yeah, like, uh, relative to all the other stuff, he just said, like, yeah, easy, you give up your stuff. Yeah. And importantly, um, men who give up, who have none, have more freedom because people don't have a leverage on them. They can't threaten them by taking away something, right? Yeah. You have yeah. less attachment to the physical. Yeah. Um, and in the last couple of pages, he talks about the sentiments of democracy and humanity. Um, let me read these whole last two pages, actually, because um, I think they're very interesting. Um, the, okay, over and above the mystery of self-surrender, there are in the cult of poverty, other religious mysteries. There's the mystery of veracity. Naked came I into this world, etc. Whoever first said that possessed this mystery. That's from um, Job. Yep. My own bare entity must fight the battle. Shams cannot save me. There is also the mystery of democracy, or sentiment of the equality before God of all his creatures. This sentiment, which seems in general to have been more widespread in Mohammedan than in Christian lands, which was interesting. I didn't really understand that. More democracy in, Mo in Muslim lands? I didn't exactly understand that. Maybe democracy before God? Whatever tends to nullify man's usual acquisitiveness. Those who have it spurn dignities and honors, privileges and advantages, preferring, as I said in a former lecture, to grovel on the common level before the face of God. It is not exactly the sentiment of huma humility, though it comes so close to it in practice. It is humanity, rather refusing to enjoy anything that others do not share. A profound moralist writing of Christ's sayings, write, write, writing of Christ's saying, sell all thou hast and follow me, proceeds as follows. Christ may have meant, if you love mankind absolutely, you will as a result not care for any possessions whatever, and this seems a very likely proposition. But it is one thing to believe that a proposition is probably true, it is another thing to see it as a fact. If you loved mankind as Christ loved them, you would see his conclusion as a fact. It would be obvious. You would sell your goods, and they would be no loss to you. These truths, while literal to Christ, and to any mind that has Christ's love for mankind, become parables to lesser natures. There are in every generation people who, beginning innocently, with no predetermined intention of becoming saints, find themselves drawn into the vortex by their interest in helping mankind, and by the understanding that comes from actually doing it. The abandonment of their old mode of life is like dust in the balance. It is done gradually, incidentally, imperceptibly, thus the whole question of the abandonment of luxury is no question at all, but a mere incident to another question, namely, the degree to which we abandon ourselves to the remorseless logic of our love of others. That's from J.J. Chapman's in the political nursery. Okay. I don't know. So weird. I don't know if I understand. I 
think I might at least understand some of what the JJ Chapman guys trying to say. Um, like, so the fact that you or I, we both haven't sold all that we have and given it to the poor, right? Okay. Um, so he see he would see us as taking it as a likely proposition that that is the proper response to seeing poverty in the world, whereas people who either have feel that vector towards um, love of humanity very greatly would see it as an absolute fact where it is they have no other option to do otherwise other than to sell their all that they have and give it to the poor. And so um, I think he's, it kind of goes back to the, the degree to the power of your sentiment determines how you read that passage and how you read that passage kind of plays into how you act and to like the, the, the degree to which you yeah. act on it. So the way that you interpret um, Christ saying changes how you act. Yeah. That makes basic sense. Yeah. And well, and also the, the way that you interpret those sentiments is at least in part um, based off of um, your initial temperament as well, right? Yeah. So if you, but then again, he also talks about people having um, no predetermined intention of becoming saints and they find themselves drawn into that vortex. So yeah. I don't know. Um, yeah. This yeah, and but how does what does that have to do with democracy? No idea. I have no idea. I don't know. But this last page, I wanted to read the whole thing because it's wild. Okay. And this will be the last thing. Well, it's the last page. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But in all these matters of sentiment, one must have been there oneself in order to understand them. No American can ever attain to understanding the loyalty of a Briton towards his king, of a German towards his emperor. Nor can a Briton or German ever understand the peace of heart of an American in having no king, no Kaiser, no spurious nonsense between him and the God, the common God of all. That's very interesting, actually, that that James associates American style government with Protestantism. Yeah. Yeah. If sentiments as simple as these are mysteries which one of which one must receive as gifts of birth, how much more is is this the case? with those subtler religious sentiments which we have been considering. One can never fathom an emotion or divine its dictates by standing outside of it. In the glowing hour of excitement, however, all incomprehensibilities are solved and what was so enigmatical from without becomes transparently obvious. Each emotion obeys a logic of its own and makes deductions which no other logic can draw. Piety and charity live in a different universe from worldly lusts and fears and form another center of energy altogether. As in a supreme sorrow, lesser vexations may become a consolation. As a supreme love may turn minor sacrifices into gain, so a supreme trust may render common safeguards odious. And in certain glows of generous excitement, it may appear unspeakably mean to retain one's hold of personal possessions. The only sound plan, if we are to, if we are ourselves outside the pale of such emotions, is to observe as well as we are able those who feel them, and to record faithfully what we observe. And this, I need hardly say, is what I have striven to do in these last two descriptive lectures, which I now hope will have covered the ground sufficiently for our present needs. Okay, so I guess he says this earlier, there's this earlier part about having different, it's, it's, you're very unable to sympathize with the nationalism of a non, somebody of another nation. Yeah. And, um, And in the same way, it's very hard maybe to sympathize with someone who has this kind of extreme emotion. So you need to feel it yourself to kind of go through it. Yeah. Um, I kind of want to hit your point of him, of uh, James associating um, the United States governance towards uh, the similarities between that and Protestantism. Because mm -hmm. um, 
Um, it makes me think of Johnson and Koyama's persecution and toleration. They talk about the, the pluralism of the different religious denominations within America that led um, the US government to separate itself from having like a top-down structure associated with um, the church and the state. And so that's kind of the same way that Protestantism ends up playing out, What uh, right? So you've got no centralized authority um, within, uh, yeah, within Protestantism um, to, to guide um, how the denominations play out, um, what their theology will be, um, and then like who will be one. And so in the same way, like the U.S. government um, did not institutionalize any of the, the Protestant um, denominations. And so it allowed itself to become like a really good growth place for new Protestant denominations and then um, for competition amongst Protestant denominations that you wouldn't have in like a Catholic com uh, country. Yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, somehow the, this, the question, we might want to get Jacob to watch this and comment on the general pluralism aspect of this yeah. stuff, of just having different authorities and di different emotions. They have to be regulated with relative stability for any kind of order to be built. Yeah, you can't serve so, two masters. And that includes a religious yeah. order. So I think that we should see liberalism as the groundwork to allow people to build stable religions, not as a um inherently a, a system asking for inherent instability or yeah. immediacy because i just read john locke's um concerning religious toleration letter on religious toleration mm -hmm. and there was a, some very good parts but there was also some parts where he associated the mixture of church and state or non-toleration with certain kinds of religion so he almost ends up saying things like um a church that thinks that the rituals matter is necessarily going to be tyrannical in some mm. sense. So I want to get rid of that kind of attitude. Yeah. But still allow for people to actually converse and talk about things. Yeah. So exciting. Yeah. Good, good work. We'll right. uh, be back next time. The next one is on him actually, the next one's going to be really interesting, I think, because this one was a lot of quotes and a lot of descriptions of what it's like to be a saint. The next one I think is going to be is on why it's good to be a saint. So yeah, I think so. It's gonna be exciting. Okay. Yeah. Goodbye. Okay. Bye.